big and scary and hairy. Those are our first impressions of who Esau is, if you go through the book of Genesis. He's a hunter. He's outside all the time. He doesn't think before he acts. He makes very rash decisions. He's the one who's out there in the world hunting down animals while Jacob is at home reading and studying and cooking and doing things inside. And of course, as we remember well too, Esau is very, very hairy. He has so much hair that Jacob has to put fur on himself to pretend to be him. In the first couple chapters that we meet Esau, he's someone who gets angry. He gets very angry twice at his own twin brother Jacob. First, when Jacob steals his uh, steals his inheritance, or, um, and then the second time when he steals his blessing. And that second time, Esau is so angry that he plans to kill Jacob as soon as their own father Isaac passes away. Imagine being that angry at someone, at an own brother or sister, that as soon as a parent dies, as soon as you didn't worry about their grief anymore, you would attack and kill them. That is where Esau is. From the start, Esau appears to be the enemy, the villain, the one Jacob and all of us should be scared of and run away from. If this was a a cartoon, he would be the character the hero would have to save the damsel from. He'd be like Brutus to Popeye or Bowser to Mario. He'd be like the one with the, the mustache that curls up tying the lady to the train tracks. That's what we would think about Esau. He's the bad guy. He's the enemy. He's the one to avoid, or so we think. After he threatens to kill Jacob, Jacob gets word of this and runs away from home. He's gone for 20 years. And I know we can say 20 years, but that's hard to fully imagine. 20 years. Imagine being away from someone you love for 20 years. Being away from a spouse sibling or children for 20 years. It'd be very, very hard. But Jacob's away for 20 long years, away from everything and everyone he ever knew. And finally, after 20 years have gone, he can't stay away any longer. He still knows he, he hasn't done anything yet to make up what he did to Esau. And that Esau may still be very angry at him and even want to kill him. But that longing to be reconciled, to go back, To be with those he misses and loves is so strong. And finally, he hears God saying to him too, Jacob, I want you to go back home. So he goes, knowing that Esau, his brother, is still in that land. And not only is Esau this big, hairy, scary guy, but Jacob is actually the one who is most at fault in this story. He's the one who first hurt Esau. He stole Esau's blessing. He tricked their father. He pretended to be him. It's not Esau who was in the wrong. It was Jacob who was in the wrong in these stories. It was him who was the trickster, the liar, the thief. And Jacob left home before he could do anything at all to make up for it, before he could make it right. So as Jacob approaches home, he gets ready to face this person that we still think of as this big, hairy, scary guy who makes rash decisions, who does what he wants in the moment, and who now has an army of 400 strong men with him. Jacob is so scared that he divides his family up the night before, and then in the morning when he goes to meet him, he puts them all way behind him, worrying if anything happens, maybe they can flee away. Jacob brings gifts and money and livestock to pay off his brother's anger. He sends them all way ahead of him, hoping that first... There's maybe a a carrot, something to pay off, and then if that doesn't work, maybe the rest of his family can run and flee and escape. He thinks, at most, maybe Esau will temper that anger out of desire for those things, for those items, for the livestock and wealth. Maybe he can buy off his brother's grace or forgiveness. Maybe he can buy off his brother's welcome. And as he gets closer, he bows his head to the ground seven times, hoping this act of humility will somehow stop Esau's anger and violence. Jacob, at this moment, thinks it's all on him to make things right. But as Jacob approaches, something truly incredible happens. 
Esau, the brother we think of as the villain, as the bad guy, as the scary, hairy, slightly older twin with an axe to grind, this Esau does something we never would have imagined. Esau runs up to his brother, not to hurt him, but to hug him, to kiss him, and to cry on his neck. Esau welcomes him not with violence or bloodshed or even anger or bitterness, but he welcomes him like the father of the prodigal son, running out to meet him, saying, you are simply welcome. I'm so glad you are home. You don't need to do anything to make it right except be my brother. He welcomes him with just incredible grace and love. The story shows for us that God doesn't work just in the people we expect. God's light and joy and grace and faithfulness isn't just in those that look like us or are similar to us or fit the mold of what we think of as saints. God's light and joy sometimes shines most brightly through the most unexpected of human vessels. God's light even shines to the people we might be afraid of. Even those who are far different from us. Even those we might be told to avoid and stay away from because their group is bad. It is in our most feared enemies and our most unlikely friends that we see God's amazing grace most clearly. Before I went to, to seminary and then on to, to serve in full-time ministry, I spent a year as a young adult volunteer in Northern Ireland, and many of you have known that about me. During that year, I served with a, a Presbyterian church in North Belfast called White House Presbyterian. In that church, as soon as I got there, I realized this church was very active in North Belfast in the work of reconciliation between Protestant and Catholic communities. Uh, different communities that's not just about religion, but about really uh, kind of bad blood and bad history and even political differences in the two groups that go back not decades, but centuries. This church though, was very active in trying to bridge that and trying to reach out and even did multiple services every year with the local Catholic church and did things with outreach in local communities. And one big reason for this may be their own history. In 2001, a few years before I got there, a nearby Catholic church, a sister church, just down the road from White House Presbyterian, was attacked one night. They were attacked by a Protestant loyalist paramilitary. This wasn't that unusual at the time. That church luckily survived the attack. They didn't get burned down or any too long of damage. But there was anger at that attack. And so a few nights later, a Catholic, Republican paramilitary group decided to get their revenge. And they decided to do this by attacking that Presbyterian church down the road, White House Presbyterian. And so one night they set the church on fire. By the time members got there in the morning, all that was left of their sanctuary and beautiful building was ash. It was just the front brick wall, which still stands and is beautiful, and then ash on the whole way left. In the wider community, immediately people wanted to point fingers and have someone to blame and get back to. Because when there's attacks, that's often our first human reaction is, how do we get payback? How do we hurt someone for the hurt we just felt? And so people in the community started pointing most clearly to a family that lived right across the street from the church. This family was Catholic, and one of their family members was rumored to have connections with the Catholic Republican paramilitary. And so those in the wider community started pointing the finger and blaming this family. And even one night, there was a Protestant loyalist paramilitary group that tried to take the son of the family away from the home that came in and tried to attack them in their home. I'm sure as these rumors and news spread, that the members of White House Presbyterian Church had to be kind of torn. On one hand, this family that lived right across the street may have had something to do with the attack. They may have been forced to be a part of that firebombing. But on the other hand, this was a neighbor. 
This was someone who was a member of their community. And no one should be attacked and taken from their home. No one should be treated this way. No one should stop being cared for as this family was. So Reverend Liz Hughes, pastor of White House Presbyterian Church, visited this family the very next day. She sat down with them in the living room, heard their story, and prayed with the family. She told them that White House was here for them. And then she got up, thinking this was maybe the, the last interaction she would have with the family for a little while, as she knew she had to get back to really hard and busy work of rebuilding that sanctuary and building, and maybe even more, rebuilding the community of the church and the people around it. But a couple days later, in the midst of all that busyness, something very unexpected happened. That family across the street, they were not a wealthy family. They didn't have much at all, and at this time were really struggling and full of fear. That family came one day across the street, walking up to the church, and they didn't come empty-handed. Instead, that family came carrying this huge jar that they had. And inside this jar, it was filled with coins and cash that the family had saved for a long time for a rainy day. It was kind of their rainy day collection. And they brought it, not to show it off to the church, but to offer it. Even as they probably were facing their own rainy day right now, and could have definitely used that money and resources, they felt something inside them called to share it. Instead of keeping it, they brought it to the church, and they said, we hope this can help you rebuild. That story was shared to me by numerous members of White House Presbyterian Church during my year there. And I think it was the family that played a big part on White House rebuilding and on guiding them to the work of reconciliation they would continue to do. It was this family that showed White House the full power of grace that comes through people we least expect. It came through this family that the world would have said is the church's enemy, this family who weren't Presbyterian or even Protestant, this family that might have had connections to those who did such harm, this family on the other side of centuries of pain and division, this family facing their own fears and pain and anger who could have used it and lashed out more hurt and attacks, but instead said we want to be part of something good, of something beautiful, of something full of grace and love. It was this family that reminded them that God's love and grace and redeeming power is truly alive in this world. And it's very often alive in the people we least expect, in the most unlikely of heroes and saints like Esau, and like this family. As we go out into this world this week, may we seek signs and visions and moments of God's grace. And may we especially be on the lookout in the people we least expect. Amen.